This is episode 31 of Give Me a Chance, and it is your host to speaking, Vittoria. Hi everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Give Me a Chance. I'm so glad you have joined me once again today because we are going to listen to a pretty interesting story in a few seconds. So hold on there. This time, Terry will share with us his story of how getting diagnosed with a rare form of cancer gave him the chance to change his life. So let's get ready and let's listen to Terry's story. Hi Terry, welcome to Give Me a Chance. So good to see you. You too, Victoria. How are you doing? I'm very good. Yourself? Great. How was the wedding? The wedding was outstanding. It was a great day. The bride looked beautiful. The weather was super. Everything was, was, it was almost magical. It was almost too perfect. Oh, that's so good to hear. And indeed, for the people listening, Terry's daughter got married. So yeah, congratulations. I mean, it, it was so much fun to just watch people, you know, being happy and engaged in life and doing all that stuff compared to what I usually am experiencing, you know, during my cancer journey. So it was, for me, it was just, it was even more exciting and more fulfilling. And I, like I said, I, I told you off air, I wish we could do it again. So. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine a breath of fresh air and, and, and joy. And that's fantastic. And Terry, let me thank you again for being with me uh, today. And I mean, before I spill the beans myself, tell us something about yourself. Oh, boy. So I, I was born and raised in Chicago, which is probably the third largest city in the United States. Uh, you can't tell this from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I played <laughs> basketball in college, despite having three knee surgeries in high school. Uh, when I graduated from college, I was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. And I look back now and realize I didn't know anything about business just because I had a degree. But fortunately, I was able to find that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the, the hamburger chain. Unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different oh. forms of cancer. Uh, in terms of my professional career, uh, as I said, I was in marketing at Wendy's. I was a hospital administrator. I was a police officer. I did undercover narcotic work. I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. Oh, I had my, my own school security consulting business. I coached girls high school basketball. I was a motivational speaker. Last year became an author. But for the last nine years, I've kind of been a cancer warrior. And then finally, my wife and I have been married for 28 years. We have mm -hmm. one child, a daughter, who you just mentioned got married. She's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an officer in the new branch of the military here in the United States, the Space Force. Oh, wow. You must be really proud of that. What an, that's, that's amazing. But indeed, uh, you just mentioned it really briefly that you, uh, that you have been a cancer, uh, cancer warrior for the past years. And I can imagine that uh, that has had uh, a major impact on your life and how you was living it despite changing so many jobs and so many career switches and they are they have been fantastic but terry tell us a little bit more about uh your fight because that's where all uh, the bravery uh comes out how did you find out so it was back in 2012 uh as i mentioned i was a, a girls high school basketball coach and yeah. i had a callus that broke open on the bottom of my foot right below my third toe and I didn't think much of it initially because being a coach, you're on your feet a lot. But after it didn't heal for a couple of weeks, I went and saw a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he took a little x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that would give anybody concern. But he sent it off to have it looked at. And then two weeks later, I get a call from him and he said, you know, the more I guess the more difficulty he was having telling me what was going on, the more frightened I was becoming okay. until he just kind of laid it out. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma that appears either on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And he recommended I go to this special cancer hospital here in the United States called MD Anderson. And so I did. And I, I went there and I had the, the bottom of my foot excised, taken off uh, with the tumor. 
and I had all the lymph nodes in my groin removed. And then when I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon. And what interferon did for me was basically it gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days every week after each injection. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And interferon was not a cure. It was just a, we're going to give you this drug in the hope of, as my doctor used to say, kicking the can down the road, keeping you alive long enough for there to be more treatments. 2017, uh, the drug became so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees, which usually isn't compatible with being alive. Um, and as soon as the drug was stopped, the cancer came back. And that was 2017, 2018. I had my left foot amputated. 2019, it kind of worked its way up my leg into the shin. I had two more surgeries. And then last year, an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. And my only recourse right in the middle of the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated. And I also found out I have tumors in my lungs, which I'm being treated for now. How did you um, look at life itself the moment you were struggling so much? Yeah, it, it, you know, I guess I've kind of had ups and downs. Um, when I found out that I, I had the disease, you know, I kind of, I was like everybody else. I was just kind of living my life and, and going about doing the things that, you know, I enjoyed. And, and yeah. then I get hit with this diagnosis. And I, you know, I went through the gambit of emotions. You know, I, I was depressed. I was mad. You know, I kind of bargained with God. I, I did all that. And then I just realized that, you know what, these are the cards that I've been dealt and I'm going to have to play them and I'm going to have to play them to the best of my ability. And, and I did. And, and I, I guess what I tell people is we're all going to experience pain in our lives. And it doesn't have to be you know, a terminal illness or a chronic illness, or it doesn't even have to be an illness. Pain is inevitable. Suffering, on the other hand, that's optional. That's what you do with that pain. Do you use it to make you stronger and tougher and more determined? Or do you wallow in it and feel sorry for yourself and want people to feel sorry for you? Now, I, you know, I'm a human being. I have bad days. I cry. I get down. I feel sorry for myself. I just don't let myself stay there. So it's just a matter of using the, the, the pain. And, you know, we kind of have a saying here in the United States about just embrace the suck. This sucks. It's, it's not fun. But if you embrace that and use it to make you stronger, it's a whole lot more. You're, you're much, it's much easier for you to keep moving forward than if you just sit back and feel sorry for yourself. Yeah. And this, what you say exactly, the, the, the strength that you find in yourself to turn the situation around and, and not getting pushed down by the situation, that's a major strength. How did you uh, turn the situation around? In a way, it's a way to give yourself still a chance. I guess I, you know, I, I, a couple things. I, I made a conscious decision early on that I wasn't going to take this out on you know, a doctor or a nurse or a medical assistant or a family member or anybody else that was that was trying to help me. It, I, I'm often asked, you know, who do you blame for this? What, you know, do you blame God that you got cancer? And I kind of joke, I said, you know, God didn't get up on a Tuesday morning and check his to-do list and say, Terry Tucker, cancer. You know, I, I, I don't believe that that was the case at all. I do believe, because I have a very strong faith, that God gave me the 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 strength to get through what I've been through so far, but I don't blame anybody for this. There, there isn't somebody, to, and even if I could, what good would that do? It's not going to do me any good to blame somebody. I still have this disease. I have to deal with it. Take responsibility for your own success and happiness. And so many people never do that. You are where you are. The world owes you absolutely nothing. You've got to earn everything you get. So this is part of earning it. You know, this is this is what I do every day. I, I deal with this and I embrace that suck and I use it to make me stronger. What what did you learn from uh, from this kind of a challenging uh, period also? A couple of things. I uh one that we are 
so much stronger than we ever give ourselves the credit for. There was a there was an experiment done back in the 1950s here in the United States at a at a university called Johns Hopkins. And this professor took rats and he put rats in water, a tank of water that was over their head. And he wanted to see how long they could tread water before they would sink, before they would drown. And the average rat treaded water for about 15 minutes. And just as they were getting ready to drown, he would reach in and grab them, pull them out, dry them off, let them rest for a while. And then the second time, he put them back in that exact same tank of water. And those rats, on average, those rats treaded water for another 60 hours. Think about that. First time, 15 minutes. Oh, that's all I can do. 15 minutes, boom, I'm, I sink. Second time, 60 hours. And that told me two things. One, the importance of hope in our lives. We've got to have hope. We've got to believe that there's something better, that you know, we're striving for something better. And two, how much more our physical bodies can do than we ever give them credit for. There's a group of the military here in the United States called the Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. And they're probably some of the toughest men in the world. And they have what they call their 40% rule, which kind of dovetails in with the story I gave you about the rats. And what they say is if, if you're at the end of your rope and you can't run another mile or you know do another push-up or swim another lap, that you're only at 40% of your maximum. And you still have 60% left in reserve to give to yourself. So between those two stories... I think it's important that we all realize that the limits that we experience in life most of the time are the limits that we put on ourselves and that everything we need to be successful in life is already inside us. We just need to find it, pull it out and use it to our advantage. Was there something that really surprised you about uh, human consciousness or human strives that uh, you didn't expect before you started thinking about this topic? I don't know if some if things surprise me, but I, I, I've seen so many people and I've had people come up to me that were like, you know, I, I could never do what you did. I could never go through what you've been through. And, and my response, and, and it, it's kind of a flippant response because I, those people bother me, is like, you're right. You couldn't because you've already decided you couldn't do that. You know, and, and our minds can hold one thought at a time. Why would you make that a negative thought? I think one of the reasons we do is because it's easy. It's hard to do things, you know, that, that are difficult. And there, there's an old kind of an old saying that says, you know, but the hard is what makes it good. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And that's a, that's a decision you have to make because life is a choice. You have a choice whether to be miserable or you have a choice whether to be positive and optimistic and keep moving forward. Terry, let's talk a little bit more about your book actually, because there you find that you talk about uh, a set of different principles that really can uh, can make your life a success in a way. Can you tell us what is the most insightful thing about the book that you have written down? Let me, uh, I guess, back up and tell you kind of how the book came about, because yeah. that, that might help you understand the, some of the things that are in it. So the, the book was really born out of two conversations I had. One was with a a former player that I had coached in high school who moved to the area where my wife and I live in the United States. And my wife and I had had dinner with her and her fiance. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'm really excited that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet for a while. And then she kind of looked at me and she's like, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, and then once you find that reason, living it. So that was one conversation. And then I had a, a young man in college who reached out to me and wanted to know what I thought were the most important things he should learn to not just be successful in, in his job or in business, but in life overall. And I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. And so I, I thought about it for a while. I wanted to see if I could go a little bit deeper with him. And so I just wrote some notes and eventually came up with these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles, and I sent them to him. And then I kind of stepped back and I was like, you know, I've got a life story that fits underneath that principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle. 
So literally between the time I had my leg amputated in April of 2020 and the time I started chemo for the tumors in my lungs in June of 2020, during that three month period that I was healing, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories underneath all of those principles. And that's how the book came about. And I remember, you know, I, I had never published a book before. I was like, well, what do I do now? And it was like, well, I guess I got to sell books. I got to sell books. I got to sell books. <laughs> and I had a best selling author over in the United Kingdom who I'd connected with. And he kind of pulled me aside, you know, online. And he was like, Terry, you're missing the point. Your job is not to sell books. Your job is to help people. If you help people, your books will take care of themselves. And I was so glad he, he, he said that to me because I, I didn't write the book to get famous or to make money or, or even to get more speaking engagements. I wrote it to try to help people. And one day I had an 87-year-old man who bought the book, read it, and then reached out to me. I had no idea who this man was, reached out to me and said, if I would have had those principles when I was younger, I would have had a much better life. So when you, when you hear something like that, you think, okay, maybe this book is going to help people. There's always one principle that resonates with whoever reads it. And I'll tell you mine. Most people think with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. What if I fail? Or I, I mean, And as a matter of fact, one of the principles is about failing and the importance of failing in our lives and failing often, especially when we're young. And it's not about the failure. It's about what you learn from failing. So those are, those are a couple of the ones that are in there. There's one about um, you are the person that you're looking to become. So even if you're not that person yet, keep acting like you're that person because eventually you'll get there. And so many people I've seen, and, and Victoria, probably same with you, you know, they get to a point and then they just throw up their hands and they're like, ah, no, I'm comfortable here. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get outside my comfort zones. I'm not going to push myself. There, there was a movie here that you may have seen. It was called The Shawshank Redemption. Definitely. And they have a line in it that goes, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. If you're not living, if you're not growing, then you're dying. So don't be in that dying category. Keep pushing yourself. What, are, what is your next challenge? But I think I'd like to write another book that's that's based on the, another word that begins with S, and that's significance. Success is what we do for us, but significance is what we do for other people. Now, I think you can be both. I think you can be successful and significant, but the older I get, the more I really believe that we're all put on this earth to do one thing, and that's to serve. You know, whether you believe in God to serve God, but to, to serve your fellow man, to do things that make other people's life easier. And if we can do that, you know, if we can get out there, it, there's such a fulfillment, you know, you feel great when you help another person and, and you help another person knowing that there's no way they can repay you. You don't want to be repaid, but you know, there's no way they can. not So you just did this because you love them. You care about them. You want them to be successful. You want them to be happy. And that's a great feeling. And I love that feeling and I can't get enough of it. And I'm so looking forward to your book. I know it's going to come for now. Thank you, Terry, for everything and for sharing your story. And I wish you all the best. I know you can do it. And Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure being on your show. This was Terry's story. Throughout his life, Terry got the chance to have different careers in so many different domains. But it was in 2012 that his life turned completely around as he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. But instead of putting himself down, Terry found the strength to turn this event around and change his mindset and find his life purpose. Terry is now an author and he's put his life at the service of other people. So this was the end of this episode. Have you ever had the chance to change your life or do you know anybody who has? Please get in touch with us and leave a comment here below. And if you have enjoyed this episode, do not forget to like and subscribe to this channel and see you next time. Give me a chance on your screen and in your ears.